bilang next mm -hmm. The coin finds in particular link the site to the variant disaster. But when archaeological research started in Kagrise nearly 35 years ago, archaeologists were faced with the problem that except for ancient places of sieges like Alesia or, or Lintas in Greek Greece, they had no experiences how to act investigating an ancient pitch battle. Detection and interpretation of the mostly fragmented finds as well as the large extension of the battle area are a fundamental challenge for the study of battlefields. Some years were needed to get an understanding of what happened at the large Kagrisa battlefield. In a wide area covering at least 30 square kilometers, metal detection and excavations identified sites with rem remains of Roman military gear. They were especially discovered in the dry sandy soil at the foot of the Kagrisa hill but also in a dry sandy zone at the edge of the bog and in an area of difficult terrain with a damp sandy soil between these dry zones. You have it on the map. These red dots are sites with Roman finds. And this is the site with most finds and features, the site over Ash. And this is a very narrow strait between hill and bog. The Oberesch site is situated at the narrowest point of the strait, and excavations have been ongoing there for more than 30 years. As well as approximately 5,000 Roman finds, there have been some remarkable discoveries which shed light on the battle. For example, a turf wall which had apparently been planned and constructed by Germanic warriors shortly prior to the Roman arrival in order to better attack them. This is the site Oberesch with the excavated areas and uh, the wall, which is this uh, slight red line over here. The wall, which had eroded nearly completely, had originally had a height of around 1.5 meters was around three meters wide and extended almost 400 meters in length. But this rampart was not an enclosure. It was constructed as a curved line, you see it on the map. This simple fortification was useful to attack the Romans' flank, but the Germans could also use it as a refuge before and during the battle. Passageways afforded the Germanic warriors the opportunity of sorties and retreat. You have different gates here and here and here in war. The finds indicate intense clashes involving heavily equipped Roman legionaries, auxiliary troops and a large baggage train. Among the discoveries were the remains of offensive weapons such as lance and spearheads, arrowheads, slingshots, pieces of pillar and catapult bolts that show the use of long distance weapons while fragments of scabbards and of a sword blade indicate short distance weapons like swords or daggers. This over here, oh sorry. This is uh, um, a fitting of a, uh, a scabbard. Defensive weapons are represented by crest holders of helmets, fittings from shields and plates, buckles and fittings from laminated armor, hooks from ring mail shirt, pieces of belts and apron fittings. You have them on this slide. This is a face mask of a Roman helmet, one of the first finds from the site. Pieces of um, laminated armor, ring mail shirts. This is a cheek piece. Um, and of a helmet and crest holders of a helmet. In addition, many nails of the legionaries' sandals were excavated and also brooches, finger rings and coins as parts of the soldiers' personal equipment. We have them here. These are 
three sandals, one pair, and the third one. The cavalry is documented by bits and spurs. And from the baggage train, we have a few metal pieces from wagons, yoke fittings from draft animals and harnesses of mules. These are yoke fittings. And this is the bridle and the bridle chain. And this is the pendant from horse gear. Above these, there are fragments of glass and silver vessels and glass eyes that probably were decorations of Roman furniture. Besides the sifter on the slides, uh, the left one, this one. And a few ceramic fragments. These pieces are indicators for luxurious objects which might have been carried on the wagons and suggest that the Varian troops did not expect to become involved in a battle since they had planned peaceful interaction with the Germans. Furthermore, there are pioneer axes, different tools for the treatment of wood and leather, medical instruments, seal boxes and steely, weights and plummets among the finds. The high number of Roman finds and the special features suggest that the Oberesch site was a key site within the extended battle area. Besides, the finds illustrate what the Roman army carried along in late Augustan times, and as a relatively closed find inventory, they also yield important chronological information. Another group of finds are bones, both human and animal, which will scarcely hope to be recovered due to the poor likelihood of preservation in the sandy soil. Besides the teeth and isolated bones, fragments from mules and horses, some more extensive portions of two mule skeletons and one horse skeleton were excavated. You have one mule over here. It's this one over here. It was preserved because of limestone nearby. And this one, uh, what zoologists uh, uh, saw at once, had a broken neck. So it died from a broken neck. Maybe it had crossed the wall or we do not know exactly. And this is another part of a mule uh, pieces uh, uh, with teeth, pieces of the skull, a chain and uh, different uh, pieces uh, from the harness. Evidently, some sections of the turf wall collapsed during the battle itself and covered the cadavers and parts of their equipment, removing them from the attentions of both looters and wild animals and leading to their preservation. Isolated human bones were also found at the surface. Many more, however, had been put into pits together with animal bones. From the absence of anatomical contexts, it was immediately clear that the dead had lain on the surface for some years before they were finally buried. Written records of the time could help to explain this fact. Tacitus reports that Germanicus visited the site of the battle with his troops in the year 1580 in order to bury the remains of the fallen. Thus, there was an exciting link between the archaeological and anthropological findings and the historical record. Six years after the defeat itself, Germanicus was able to fulfill the duty under unusual conditions, the burial of the form. He covered the skeletons with earth and thus paid them his last respects. We have uh, eight pits and you see two of them over here. This is a large one, and we have this, and this is another one very small with, with well-preserved bones because uh, they um, were covered with chalk limestone. So we have a human skull over here with the teeth. Here are, there are uh, different um, animal bones and uh, another, and this skull shows 
uh, it, um, it had a deadly cut with a sword. The Roman finds and the features at the Oberesch site, which you see with a, a black cross over here, should not be considered in isolation, but as a segment of a much large scale, larger scale military event. It is remarkable to note, however, that there have been around 5,000 Roman finds on the Oberesch site, compared with only around 500 military finds in the entire remaining area of the Pergrisa study, even though the excavated areas are of a similar size. In this context, we should not forget that battlefields are never preserved in their exact state at the end of the fighting. To understand how the archaeological finds ca come to be the way they are, we need to conduct a systematic critical analysis of the sequence of events that followed the battle based on models of human behavior that can be developed from historical sources, including from more recent military conflicts. Research at Calgrisa has proved that the rate of recovery of military items is not only linked to the intensity of the battle itself. A large part of the finds from Calgrisa are shown to be the result of a mixture of processes following the battle, including salvage and plunder, rather than direct relics of the fighting on the site. Ancient accounts of the military conflicts between Germanic tribes and Romans in the first decades after the birth of Christ have given us some points of uh, reference regarding the behavior patterns of both parties. We know, for example, that the Germanic combatants were motivated to fight by the promise of plunder later, what Cassius Dio mentions in one of his works. Elsewhere, we learn that the Roman army was trained to rescue their wounded even under dangerous conditions and to bring their baggage train into safety. This is what Tacitus tells in his annals. The effects of these actions in terms of archaeological finds can be clearly seen from the sites at Calgrisa. The battle events on Cal the Calgrisa Hill look to have been a series of guerrilla attacks by the Germanic tribesmen on the extended flank of the Roman army. You see the different sites, the gray shadow here uh, are um, fields where um, uh, it a service with a metal detector took place and the red dots are the uh, sites with Roman finds and we think that um, the Romans uh, came from the east and uh, had to walk through this uh, narrow pass uh, between the hill and the bog and fighting started somewhere in the east we do not know exactly where the first finds are here, sorry, and um, then there are more finds over here, at the edge of the hill. The Germans made guerrilla uh, attacks uh, on the extended flank of the Roman army, which was moving from east to west in a long formation. The attacks came along a long narrow stretch of leg, at least 10 kilometers in length between the hill and the bog. It would have scarcely been possible for the Roman legions to take up efficient battle formations in such terrain. Nevertheless, the Romans were initially able to fight off the attacks that came from points along the route several kilometers east of the Oberesch site. More intensive fighting occurred in the course of these attacks and must have resulted in increasing numbers of Roman losses, but it would be wrong to expect any con correspondingly large-scale archaeological finds here. As long as the Roman army's usual procedures for medical care and transport of the wounded were functional, we can assume that neither dead nor injured soldiers remained in any great numbers on the battlefield. They would have been rescued together with arms or equipment. Thus, thus, the scarcity of Roman finds along this section of the extended battle area is logical. The archaeological finds should be rather different in those areas where the Roman logistical operations disintegrated. The Oberesch, Oberesch site is probably, probably represents such an area. The dead and wounded, together with equipment and military supplies, 
remained on the side at the mercy of the victorious Germanic attackers. Mapping all artifacts at the Oberesch site, the soldiers' equipment as well as the remains of the baggage train, we realized that the Roman objects are not distributed equally. You have the red and blue dots, and again, the wall structure. This is the wall. Over here. And the red dots are from finds from excavation and blue dots from field survey. For example, pieces of the legionaries' equipment fixed to the body, that means fragments of ringmail shirts and laminated armor, as well as fragments of belts and aprons, indicate places where legionaries were killed and brutally stripped by looters. They were cl found close to the rampart, but also in its approaches. You have the two maps over here. The broad distribution of large amounts of hobnails, brooches, and coins also mark the area of movement and combat of the Roman troops. Here you have the maps with the hobnails, brooches, and here the coins. The concentration of shield fittings near the wall, however, cannot be explained as a result of the fighting. The shields were obviously collected by the Germans after the combat, and since the large, Rom large Roman shields did not fit the Germanic warriors' weaponry, they were processed to obtain the valuable metal parts. What we find today are only the last fragments of this procedure. You have the map over here, and you see the distribution nearly all the finds from the area of the wall. And here we have a few uh, fragments of uh, bronze fittings, some of, many of them folded, some examples uh, of the kind of uh, finds which are very uh, often at Calgary, so not the large finds, but very, very small finds like uh, nails and uh, fragments uh, of fittings and often um, folded like uh, those uh, on the image. The only fragment of a sword blade indicates that the Germans collected the Roman swords completely and reused them as weapons, perhaps during the ongoing clashes. The scabbards separated from the blades were, were not standardized and thus useless to the Germans. Hence, the looters processed them like the shield fittings to get the metal. Large amounts of small, often unidentifiable fragments of bronze and silver sheets, which are concentrated next to the wall, show that the central zone near the rampart was used to organize the scrapping of the valuable metal and the distribution of booty. Whereas the rarity of lance and spearheads indicates that they were collected as whole objects to be reused by the Germans, many fragments of Pila, the typical Roman lances, signify that they were scrapped. The distribution of other Roman objects, however, especially fragments of helmets, which consisted mainly of metal, and were not necessarily processed indicates an additional reason for the collection of equipment in the wall area. You have on this map you have different parts uh, from the helmets, different types, and uh, this is uh, this was the face mask, this yellow dot, and um, the other parts are fragments or crest holders. We suppose um, that the victorious Germans seem to have displayed the loser's equipment in the aftermath of the battle. After a victorious battle, the Romans used to present the weapons of the defeated enemy in the Tropeum, as is known, for instance, from the Trajan's column, you see it on the photo, or sometimes on coins. 
Shields and helmets played an important part in such a presentation, which, which was usually erected in, at the place where the enemy had fled from the battlefield. It is highly probable that Arminius, former leader of the auxiliaries, was familiar with this Roman custom. Thus inspired, he may have taken the chance to visualize to his allies from different tribes their collective success in the victory celebration. In any case, the display of weapons was succeeded by the distribution of the booty and the scrapping of the objects which were useless in their original function and too big for an easy transportation. These observations suggest a special role of the Oberesch site within the much wider battle area. West and northwest of the Oberesch, we found less Roman items, but particularly in the northwest, precious finds were unearthed with such as coin hoards or silver fittings of its cupboard. You have the map again with a whole battle area. This is the Oberesch site, the face mask, and here near the bog, we found many coins, coin hoards, and uh, the silver fittings uh, of the scabbard. This is a reconstruction, so the level was not preserved and the wood, but the silver fittings. These finds suggest flight and pursuing skirmishes where the defeated tried to hide their valuable belongings to prevent them from falling into the German hands. The weapons of the Germanic opponents are reflected in the archaeological material much worse than the equipment of the Roman troops. One spur, a shield boss, and some lance heads can be assigned to Germanic warriors. You have this probably Germanic uh, shield boss and uh, fittings and a grip, a fitting and a grip from that shield. They they together in one of the ditches of the wall. The rarity of Germanic equipment, however, can easily be explained. As victors in their own territory, the Germans were able to care for their people and their equipment, and they could bury their dead in regular cemeteries away from the battlefield. Besides, the indigenous warriors had only very little metal equipment, and some of the fighters had been auxiliaries before and used their Roman weapons. Consequently, we do not grasp the Germans as fighting enemies of the Romans, but indirectly, they are present quite well. By means of the nature and the distribution of Roman finds on the battlefield, we can roughly reconstruct Germanic attacks and the practices of the victors after the end of the battle. Besides, the Germans were responsible for the selection of the battle area. The view of the, the environmental conditions already shows that the bottleneck between hill and bog was chosen wisely for an ambush. To get more information about those factors that have determined the combat operations, we had started to analyze the conflict late landscape at Calgrise some years ago. One of the key aspects of the project was the investigation of the indigenous infrastructure. You have the map you know, here, this is the Calgrisa Hill, the bog, and uh, sites with Roman finds. And this is nearly the same and um, what we found over there, uh, some Germanic settlements. Field service and excavations have revealed indications for settlements of the late pre-Roman and the early Roman Iron Age, and we could obtain information, for example, about the size and the density of the Germanic settlements, as well as the lines of communication which existed when the Roman troops reached that region. Besides, we wanted to answer the question where the booty was left after the battle, transported to other tribal areas in the far distance or brought to settlements nearby. These five red dots are the settlements we know until today and where we had excavations. The recent studies showed the concentration of Germanic settlements in the dry sandy area at the foot of the Calgary Hill. 
It seems that neither the dry zone at the edge of the bog nor the top of the hill were used for settlements. The distribution of finds shows that the Roman troops were guided by the infrastructure of the indigenous population when they were marching along the hill. Two of the settlements which were inhabited around the time of Christ's birth could partly be excavated during the last years. They are situated in a distance of two to four kilometers east, respectively west of the Oberesch. This was this side over here, the number one. This is the Oberesch side. And the number two is another settlement we excavated uh, in our last project. Probably the settlement density in the area at the hill was much higher than we know today. But a thick layer of turf on the fields is a hindrance for field service, and we always have to excavate the site to get detailed information. During the Middle Ages, um, the farmers used turf as a natural fertilizer for the fields. So sometimes we have one meter of turf on the fields, and that means uh, that uh, only very few finds um, and hardly any uh, uh, ceramics uh, can be found uh, at the surface. The site west of the Oberesch, site number two, is, was of special interest. A few farmhouses were unearthed, which indicate that the settlements were quite small. You have a map of the excavation of the excavated area and a model of uh, uh, a Germanic farmhouse of the time of uh, Christ's birth. Such a farmhouse, uh, some of such farm, uh, um, such farmhouses were found, uh, post holes were found uh, during the excavations on the site, which was uh, interesting to us. Besides uh, the features, more than 100 Roman military objects were discovered at this site. Some show traces of ch chiseling, and together with drops of molten bronze, they uh, seem to indicate that Roman equipment had been processed by the Germans. Then we had uh, to, it had to be discussed whether the Roman objects had been collected at some other place in the battle area and were taken to the settlement as booty or if they can be taken as evidence for fighting at this site. After a detailed analysis, we may say that the distribution pattern argues for the latter inter interpretation. Since the finds are scattered of the, the whole site, you have the green dots and uh, red dots um, on the map and you see they are not concentrated, they are scattered um, among the features. If the Roman finds were to be interpreted as booty, one might expect the craftsman's sword, for example, since the Roman coins, seal boxes, gaming pieces or brooches were not used by the Germans in daily life. You have some of the finds over here, this is a seal box and uh, different other, some, some brooches and uh, different other, mostly small finds. There were also found rather worthless items, such an iron crest holder and nails. Altogether, the quality of finds is comparable to what was found at the Oberesch site. Perhaps some of the, the skirmishes took place in a small settlement which the inhabitants had temporarily left not long before the Roman troops arrived. This part of the battlefield was also plundered at the end of the conflict, where the inhabitants of the settlement may have found last small remains by chance and used them as raw material for the production of their own metal objects. So far, our uh, information about the Calgary's project itself. Battlefield archaeology is a relatively new subdiscipline in the field of archaeology, which has been able to develop in the last couple of decades due to the systematic use of metal detectors. 
For this reason, there is currently little experience in the evaluation of the significance of archaeological items excavated from the sites of armed conflict. Often written accounts of world changing conflicts provoke us by citing the huge number of battle dead and the loss of equipment, leading us to harbor expectations, expectations of a correspondingly large amount of finds in our excavations. The analysis of the finds in Calguisa has already shown the extent to which post-battle processes affected the archaeological preservation of military remains, not just contributing to their reduction, but also manipulating and influencing them in many other ways. The methods and thesis that we have developed at Calguisa in turn provide the basis for the ex examination of other historical and not necessarily ancient battlefields, though we must keep in mind that the virus battle is a very special example since the Roman troops had a large amount of equipment with them amongst the many items not necessary for combat. They suffered heavy losses and thus that the Roman army was not able to care for the dead before six years later. Thanks for your interest and attention. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, uh, uh, Suzanne and Akim. Thank you very much. I think it's only <laughs> it, yeah, Suzanne. <laughs> I think it's only fair that um, if um, if people like to unmute their microphones um, and uh, give Suzanne uh, a round of applause, it's uh, it, the, one of the downsides of Zoom is we can't hear our audience. But maybe if they turn their microphones off and uh, and give a round of applause, then you understand that. Uh, there, are, there are almost 100 people who have enjoyed your talk tonight, um, and it was fascinating. Um, it, it, it brings a, a new interpretation of the phrase between a rock and a hard place, or maybe between a rock and a boggy place. Um, uh, that, 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 and the fact that you were able to um, squeeze uh, many, many years of research um, into such an informative and um, a quick 45 minutes is, is fantastic. So thank you so much. Uh, it is much appreciated. Um, if people tonight have got some questions, then please do pop them in the chat um, and we'll get, take a chance. Um, as, as, <laughs> as one of our uh, audience members has said, um, uh, wow, amazing was the, the phrase. Um, and there's been numerous comments coming in, uh, Suzanne and Akim, um, uh, saying how enjoyable the talk's been this evening. Uh, and what a fascinating subject. Um, maybe I could turn to John, our chairman, and maybe John, if you're with us, if you could turn your microphone on, uh, maybe um, uh, maybe a, a, a quick a question that you would like to pose. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Akim and Suzanne for 30 years of fabulous work there. It's, a, it's exemplary. And it, for me, once I read about the work that had been done at Calcrisa, it really was an exemplar for how battlefield archaeology should be done. So I'd like to congratulate them on that. Um, the, the question that I'd like to start off by asking is, how did you decide which areas to excavate once you knew about the Oberesh Told you that. concentration? How did you decide? Would, was it by metal detection oh, or I... did you lay it out? And, and do it systematically? Well, the first excavation started in a wood because uh, it didn't cost anything. There were some free areas in the wood of the uh, Oberesch site. There had been some finds and then... Uh, by detecting. This, by de metal detecting. Metal detecting. And yeah. then there were excavations in free areas in the wood. And mm -hmm. uh, then on a field uh, uh, nearby. And uh, by chance, it was the first ditch were the face mask, other Roman finds, and the, the first hands for wall were excavated. At the Oberesch. Wow. The Oberesch <laughs> site. So it was uh, 50 or 100 meters uh, further to the west or to the, to the east. The structure is, can hardly be seen. So it was really lucky to find it in the first ditch. And then we, uh, we enlarged the area and tried to find other parts of the wall. We, uh, in, in the beginning, we thought it was a semicircle, 
and then we saw uh, different other parts and uh, realized it was uh, zigzagging. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we had uh, finds and we wanted to uh, excavate in an area um, north of the wall. And suddenly we, we found uh, uh, more, uh, some of the bone pits. So and then we excavated that area. So just by chance. And um, uh, the Germanic settlements uh, some years later were uh, found when uh, colleagues um, made, an ex made excavations to find uh, Roman, where, where some Roman finds had been found before uh -huh. by metal detecting. And uh, by chance, they did not find many Roman finds, but uh, Germanic structures. And they looked for further parts of a wall structure. But after uh -huh. some years, uh, we uh, discovered it was just the, ob just the Obash where uh, uh, these structures uh, could be um, discovered. Right, I see. And it, they, they didn't find any wall structure out of the Obash, but these uh, Germanic settlements. And it's, it was a kind of, of, in the beginning, kind of rubbish <laughs> because yep. we were interested in the Roman uh, artifacts. And uh, time by time, we got the idea uh, these Germanic settlements can give us a lot of escape. But you can never uh, oh. say where well, you get finds. Uh, well, not some that we were astonished about the finds in the beginning. We had many Roman finds and everybody thought uh, there must be more and more finds anywhere. But well, that was mm -hmm. not correct. We had, suddenly we had areas with only very few finds. So uh, in, a, in a settlement, uh, when you have a house, you can, uh, you know what you can expect. Some other houses um, and um, finds, but on a battlefield, you, you can't, ex uh, you should not expect something. That's some people always said in the beginning and, and still later, you, you must look for this and that because Tacitus has written about it. You must find uh, <laughs> uh, the burial uh, um, mounds. You must find uh, Roman military equipment, whole um, armors, and more than what you have found. But uh, I always said I I try to interpret what what I have found, and do not try to find what other people want to find me to find and the mm -hmm. uh, um, small number of finds east of the Oberesch uh, mm -hmm. were um, not be seen in the beginning as um, serious hints on 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 fights so this method methodological methodological background um, has to we had to develop it step by step mm -hmm. uh, and we talk about the conflict landscape now and say there have been different attacks, different uh, areas with fightings. And uh, some say there, is there are only uh, finds, many finds at the Oberesch site and mm -hmm. uh, only one site. And that cannot be the Battle of Varus because it must be larger, but it is large. But uh, it's not, um, we do not have so many finds in other parts of the, the area, of the battle area. We had tried to explain it in short words because the, in the east, the Romans could uh, still uh, rescue ah. their dead and wounded uh, soldiers. And at the Oberesch sites, um, nobody was able to do anything more. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I see there are other questions. So thank you. Yes. Lovely. Brandon. Thank you. Thank you, John, for asking the question. Thanks, uh, Susanna Rackham, for that. Um, a, a question maybe from Lee Murphy O'Connor, which is uh, one close to my heart, seeing as we've just opened a museum in Melrose for Trimontium, uh, and he's asking a question about, well, if, if Lee, is, is your microphone open? Can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Ah, brilliant. Do you want to fire away your question? Because it's a good one, because I've been, I've been thinking about this myself. I was just wondering, is there a, a local museum displaying all the wonderful artifacts? Roman yeah, there <laughs> yes, there is a museum at the site Oberesch, and okay. uh, they display uh, many of the artifacts. Great, thank you. 
Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for asking that one, because it's because obviously uh, uh, while we've been talking this evening, I've been looking around uh, the area of what's available. And there seems to be uh, a beautiful museum from from architecturally from the first look, but also uh, the way it's set in the landscape looks stunning from the shots I've seen this evening. So uh, so I think it's well worth a visit um, as hopefully our flights and our traveling eases. Um, I, I wonder if Sabine's still with us. She's got a question about um, uh, that she'd like to ask. Uh, Sabine, are you still with us? Yes, I was just wondering if there are any Roman finds that date later the 9 AD. The, the uh, Roman military artifacts um, can't be dated very exactly, but the coins, the, the coins are the main help to date this place. And there are no younger coins than um, 9 AD. But there is a discussion if this um, dating by coins is really uh, perfect. Uh, there are uh, colleagues uh, from historians who um, um, argue that perhaps it could be in the uh, context of uh, Germanicus. But we don't have, we have um, copper coins uh, from the first Lupunum series, many of them, none of the uh, later series, and we have uh, many coins with the countermark of Varus. So this uh, seems to be uh, a hint uh, that it's not later than nine. But uh, if there should be a coin later, we have said that the bone pits were buried, were uh, dug by uh, the Germanicus tr uh, troops. So they might have lost one or two coins if they had them with them. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Thanks for being, thanks for the question, that's great. Um, uh, quite a practical question has come in from, from Justin, and I don't know if our technicalities will let us do this, but early on in your presentation, Suzanne, I think there was a, a larger map of, um, a larger scale map, and one of our overseas uh, attendees from Colorado, Justin, was just mentioning, could you flip back to that larger mm -hmm. map and just pinpoint, maybe with just your mouse, um, the location um, I yeah. think that would be useful because we, I mean, we sometimes obviously with the wonders of Zoom and our Tremontium talks are now reaching across the globe, as we well know. Um, we sometimes get over familiar with Europe, um, living within it. But of course, we've got people from all over. So that's probably the map. And if you could maybe your mouse will show up, maybe if you. Yep. Yeah, if yeah. you could point yes, and uh, try to explain. Yeah, um, this is um, the area. Uh, this is a later Limes over here, and uh, this is uh, the area of the Roman um, yes, in Empire uh, in Augustan times. This is uh, the River Rhine of Xanten, and uh, Pagrisa is over here, and uh, this is northern Germany, and you have uh, this small map over here. Here you have Hamburg and Osnabrück. This is Lower Saxony and uh, the Netherlands. Amsterdam would be here and Berlin would be over here. See? And this is um, the area of the Kalkuise battlefield, a bit north of, uh, of Osnabrück. That's fantastic. Um, Justin, are you still with us? Can you, can you hear us, Justin, uh, over in uh, Colorado? Yes, I can. And, and that helps a great deal. <laughs> be oriented to where on this map yeah. you are. Absolutely. Sorry, I didn't explain oh. it. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all, not at all. That's fine, you know, and it, and um, uh, that's the wonders, you know, uh, traditionally the Trust has, has run lectures and talks in, in the Ormiston Hall within Melrose uh, to people who can journey a few miles that evening, but the wonders of Zoom uh, and let's say a benefit of the pandemic is that we're now reaching much further across the ocean. So Justin, it's great to have that point made clear tonight and uh, thanks Suzanne for jumping back to that slide. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, I wondered, and, and now we're gonna, we're gonna test my pronunciation, um, uh, is uh, Anne or Ain with us, Ain Sweeney? Um, you had a question, I'm not sure if you're still with us, A-I-N-E, um, are you still with us this evening? Um, maybe not, but I believe that the question was similar 
to a following question, and that was with um, Martin in the Netherlands. Martin, are you still with us? Let's see if a microphone clicks in or not. But um, I am. <laughs> ah, Martin, great, fantastic. Would, would you like to fire away with um, what you'd like to ask, Suzanne? I was wondering if any Roman uh, structures were found, military or defensive or um, any other. No, in the beginning we thought we had a Roman camp uh, some um, kilometers uh, east uh, from the Oberesch over here. But um, they um, an exca later excavation uh, proved it was a medieval uh, structure, different ditches. And because of the layer of the plug and ash, it's um, really a problem to discover marching camps. Yeah. And but, something like this. Yes, so we tried uh, yeah, uh, photographs and, and different other uh, things, but methods, but uh, it's um, one meter of turf on the field, on the old surface, uh, is too much uh, for most techniques. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I wonder if um, I'm going to try once more because I've, I've had a message from Anne or Ayn. I do apologise for my pronunciation. Um, I wonder if your microphone will work and if we can hear you. Um, can, can you. Can you hear us? No, I don't think we can. So the question along the, was on the, along the lines of, and I'm just going to try and pull it back up. Uh, as I as I talk, um, the wall, the, the curvilinear wall, the original function of that was the question coming in from the uh, from the attendee. Uh, that original function of the curvilinear wall, as she pronounces it or writes it. The function of the wall. Yeah. Uh, yes, we think uh, that the uh, Germans built the wall just uh, to prepare this ambush when they expected the Roman troops. They had time to build such a structure in a few days. And uh, it was, uh, we have uh, the wall and uh, ditches in some parts of uh, the wall, uh, uh, only pits over here, uh, drainage ditches. And um, here the wall, At the, on the bottom of the ditches, there are Roman finds. So they must, uh, um, be, must have been open uh, when the wall was used and the battle took place and uh, the wall was uh, prepared to, to hide behind the wall, to attack the Romans, which probably marched along this area. Sorry, that's the curve over here. Uh, here must have been uh, the path the Romans uh, used in front of the wall. So the Germans could hide behind the wall and could attack uh, through, the gates. The, oh. the, uh, through the gates, could attack the Romans over here and could retreat uh, behind the wall when the Romans uh, tried attacks too. So it was a, uh, an offensive structure <laughs> and not, a, uh, not so much a defensive structure. Okay, and this now. is uh, here, not the bog, but the wet area starts. Here we have the hill which is uh, not easily uh, passable. Here we have um, a creek and over here we have a creek. So it's nearly, um, though the wall was not closed, it was nearly a closed structure. And um, the uh, Romans could not really... To stabilize uh, the narrow. Uh, the Romans could not uh, really uh, fight in this um, narrow um, area. Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you for that question. And uh, thank you, uh, Suzanne and Achim. Um, uh, the clock has ticked round to 8pm. 8, 8 uh, and I think uh, that's fantastic. There's been a, lo a lovely group of questions, a fantastically interesting presentation, uh, which we have recorded. Um, and as ever, I'll go back and look at the recording because I spend a lot of my time um, jumping through the chat and missing various slides. So um, uh, that will be up on our website um, uh, within three or four days um, and uh, anybody can view that um, if they'd like to go back and see Suzanne's presentation this evening. Uh, I'd like to on behalf of the Trust 
Uh, thank you for the time taken to prepare this and present this, this evening. Um, and I do, I would like everyone, please try and unmute your microphones and, uh, and, and give Suzanne and Akim a, another round of applause this evening, please. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was nice to have you here in our oh. house. <laughs> well, it was, fantastic. it was fantastic to welcome you into the borders uh, and into the wider world of Zoom talks. Um, it, absolutely greatly appreciated. Um, and, and maybe, you know, um, we've uh, whetted a few appetites to travel across um, uh, various oceans uh, and across the continent and, and to visit you guys as we always encourage people to visit ourselves in the borders here at Tremontium. Um, what a lovely place to try and visit um, as maybe uh, travel opens up and we can start getting out and about again. So thank you again to the Trust, Suzanne and Akim. Very much appreciated. Um, and we wish everyone a, a good evening and we will see you all in a month's time. Thank you very much. Night. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks for Thanks. the organisation. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, Akim. You are more than more Thanks. than welcome to retire for the evening. <laughs> <laughs>